Okay. Brilliant. All right. Um, thanks everyone for joining this afternoon for our latest uh, community group call. Um, the uh, focus today um, is going to be on the uh, spec. Um, I'm going to give it a quick, quick update on where we're at with uh, various various bits of the program. Um, just on the screen. Yeah, it might be worth going on mute um, if you're not talking. Now. Perfect. There we go. Okay. So um, hopefully you can see the agenda. Um, so I'm going to do a quick uh, progress update um, on where we are with. Um, uh, the standards and tools work in general, uh, give a quick summary of the feedback that we've had so far on the booking spec um, and then we wanted to focus most of the call on having a discussion around some of that feedback focusing on the, the way that the API flow currently works um, or could, could work in future uh, based on uh, some preferences that people have shared. Um, so I, we'll have, I'll try and keep a couple of minutes at the end if anyone's got any other issues to raise. Um, so in terms of a, a progress update, um, hopefully you all saw that we published the, um, the 2.0 data model specification last week. Um, so thanks to everybody that contributed to that piece of work and the discussions on getting it um, updated. Um, specs finalized and we've also um, updated the uh, validator that we've been working on uh, so that it's conformant with the spec. Um, so you can go to validator.openactive.io um, and that tool will uh, be checking against the, the 2.0 specification. Um, we're planning to keep that tool updated as we do further, um, further work on the spec. Um, it's open source um, and we're hoping that we can sort of turn that into a uh, community maintained uh, resource um, as we think there's probably uh, plenty of additional advice that it could be including over time to help people improve the quality of their data. Um, the, we also said that we were looking at other ways to improve um, the support of providing to people who are uh, publishing and using the open data. Um, so we have um, uh, launched a new developer site uh, which is at developer.openactive.io um, so uh, thanks to Nick for pulling together um, the first version of this and, and a whole bunch of the initial content um, we've got some more tutorials and information to drop into there um, what we're telling this to be is to be the main reference point for people who are starting to publish and use uh, data as part of Open Active. Um, so we obviously continue to work on the specifications as the kind of main reference point for all of the kind of more formal aspects of the data model. But in terms of providing a uh, tutorials and quick reference, um, we want to start directing people's attention here. Um, um, quick question, Lee. Sorry, um, is that aimed at like complete beginners? Or is it there kind of some level of knowledge needed? Kind of where, what, uh, I guess, who's, who's it pitched at? Um, I mean, it, it's aimed at developers. The, the, I mean, the main Open Active website has got introduction to what Open Active is, what op opportunity data is, um, and the broad goals of the program. This is intending for people who have been tasked with starting to publish data as part of an Open Active or are looking to build applications against the existing data feeds. Um, so, you know, it assumes that you know your way around uh, JSON and a data model, et cetera. Um, does, that, does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this Sorry, can, I, can I just uh, throw in a word there? Um, I've already said this to you before, Lee, so forgive me if I'm just repeating myself blindly. Um, I love your documentation. I think it's a great introduction. But I find if I'm dropping into it, it's hard for me to pick out for any given part of the system what data needs to be there. And I think what will be helpful for me anyway is a kind of a swagger level of documentation uh, where you can see all of what a post or a, a feed might have in one go. Um, because within the, I've had a little look at this and I recognize that there's some better descriptions, fuller descriptions of object models. And I think that's very helpful. Uh, and so I think it's a really good first step. 
I think it'd be great if we could take that forward and have something where you can explore um, a whole post effectively or a whole everything that goes into um, a, a feed or, or, or back from it in a formal way. Because that way we could see, you know, you see what you need and what you don't need. That's me. Sure, thanks. Um, and you've um, jumped ahead a little bit for, uh, for what I was going to mention. But yes, um, uh, in terms of, uh, of improving documentation for the APIs, then that is something that we will be looking at. Um, so what's in the current developer site at the moment there's going to be some basic background information on what a data feed is, how they work, um, reference to the, the data models. There's a little explainer video for the, um, the real time uh, page data API. Um, so um, we think this just kind of brings forward where we're at. It doesn't meet every type of um, documentation use case we've got identified. Um, there's a variety of different um, different types of support that we know people need. So um, we're going to keep keep the, spec the formal specifications as the uh, kind of authoritative source. There'll be this uh, reference, additional reference implementation tutorials, and then we'll add to it over time with some um, uh, Swagger documentation, which you, you uh, previously highlighted. And we did have for um, some of the earlier iterations of the booking spec. Um, so have to take a look at the developer site, but happy to take feedback on the content that's in there. Um, in terms of where we're at with the booking work, um, we've been iterating on the, the 1.0 draft. The last version of that was published on the 12th of September. So over the last few weeks, um, we've been soliciting feedback um, from a number of you on the current state of that document. Um, to, uh, to basically just get a sense of how, um, how we can move forward from here, uh, whether people have any concerns around the design or questions about um, how to start implementing it. Um, I think what we've concluded from that is that we need to give um, ourselves and the community a little bit more time to explore implementing the spec. Um, so rather than trying to push to get to you know, a, uh, a 1.0 document you know, in the next uh, week or two, we want to leave some time for um, uh, iteration based on uh, discussions like we're going to have in a moment. Um, but also uh, to give time for um, implementations um, because what we're finding is that um, we get some attention on the spec, um, some useful feedback, but when people actually start to try and implement it, it, it throws up a bunch of questions, um, more detailed bits of feedback, um, which tends to come through in, in sort of drips and drabs. So um, I know Nick has been speaking to a number of people about um, trying to get implementations up and running. Um, so we want to kind of give a bit of time to collate that feedback from practical use before uh, rubber stamping the spec so that everyone's got confidence that what we've got in 1.0 is a uh, implementable specification that will give us a useful foundation for some of the other requirements that we've talked about in uh, some of our workshops and discussions over the last few months. Um, so just give you a quick overview of the, the feedback we've had so far. There's some um, general requests for clarifications or improvements to the documentation. Um, more examples required. Um, Ian's request for um, having a swagger version as well uh, to help people dig into the individual API calls. Um, so we'll obviously be taking that on board and doing some further uh, iterations. Um, there's the discussion we had a few weeks ago around handling of um, cancellations initiated by the booking platforms and when and where it's appropriate to use webhooks for some of that. Um, we haven't quite bottomed out uh, that um, the, tech, the right technical solution there yet. Um, some of the new stuff that's come up in the last few weeks, um, some feedback on how uh, pricing is uh, handled and described in the API response, and particularly uh, um, uh, that we're not um, we're not talking about tax. Uh, we're not highlighting where there's VAT or other tax to be paid on 
uh, that sorry it makes up part of the pricing and clarifying how that gets handled through the through the workflow. Um, as people are starting to implementing it, we're also getting questions around the the scope of the spec, um, what we want to try and achieve with 1.0, um, and then how we might build on that core to add in other other requirements. You know whether it's around waiting lists or customers, etc. So there's there's some work. The kind of communications and outreach work that we need to be doing there um, but the, the uh, probably the most con <clears throat> consistent bit of feedback we've had so far is um, some concerns over the API workflow um, so the number of calls that are required in order to uh, complete an order um, particularly if um, it's free so the user doesn't have to provide any uh, payments um, and questions around how much um, state needs to be maintained by the booking platform as part of servicing uh, a series of requests from clients so because that's uh, probably the most significant one you know if we need to change the the workflow that, that that could have a larger impact on the spec we wanted to have a discussion about that this afternoon um, so before we jump into that any other comments or, or questions about where we're at with booking um, I only had uh, one comment and that was kind of around uh, the booking flows quite specific to a single booking at a time, if that makes sense, as opposed to uh, maybe you want to poll 30 different slots at the same time. It's quite an expensive process to get that information back. And I didn't know if batch requests is something that could fit within the booking spec or something to think about in the future, because otherwise you have to it's not so much of a concern of the person of the service making the request but more for the service having to deliver them all so that could be potentially um a lot of work a lot of calls but otherwise no yeah okay so there is there is an issue on the the backlog uh that relates to that um you know how well um the current approach to availability checking scales with uh situations where there's large number of slots for example um, so there is a discussion that we can um, we can dig into there, but I think some of that also relates to um, you know just the, just the number of calls uh, in general. Um, so I'm what I'm going to do is is actually hand over to Nick to lead us through the next bit of the discussion um, cool. because so Nick, do you want to? Uh, yeah. So thank you. Yep. So great. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. The microphone. Cool. Yep. Okay. So um, we've got. I'm going to finish it too. So we're going to try and do this, um, give you the content and the questions kind of as quickly as possible. I'm aware that everyone's at different places. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll start by just quickly um, running through who's on the call. So I'll call out everybody so you know who's here and then I'll just jump into the flow. So, but, but quite quickly. So thank you, Galena uh, from NetPulse, Ed from Bookingbug, Ian from Legend, Izzy from Sport England, Jamie from My Local Pitch, Kent, from Go Sweat, Patrick from um, Good Gym, Paul from Canal Riverside Trust, uh, Tom from Innovatize, and Tom from Played. Um, and us from the ODI, we've got Catherine, Lee, and myself. Um, so great to have you all here, but now you know who else is here, that might be useful um, context for you. Um, and uh, just in terms of this then, um, so the big challenge we've got in terms of the flow is if you go to the next slide there, um, the current flow um, as it stands, as Lee mentioned, involves quite a few API calls to achieve uh, what we're trying to do. Um, and Galena from um, NetPulse raised this as an issue on GitHub, so that's kind of what sparked this conversation in the first place, but then a few other people have chipped in. Um, and so at the moment, most third-party booking flows tend to capture what you can see here, which is an email address, full name, surname, credit card number, and have a, a go button. Um, and that's what that's the kind of minimum amount of information to capture. Sometimes there's a registration process as well that you go through, um, but generally that's the kind of quickest thing that you can do. And if you're using Apple Pay, it provides the same content from your, when you use your thumb, you get phone number as well, but that's the kind of, that's the MVP of stuff that you get. Um, so at the moment in the current spec, if you go to the next slide, the way that this works is the user puts all this information in and then the user clicks on the book button and then we lease from the booking system a slot to say, 
that's that's going to be available so we, we we know it's going to be available so that's reserved for us we then take the payment instruct the payment processor to take the payment and then we go and confirm that same slot um, and the reason we do it in that order is um, when you confirm the slot with the booking system and I guess the different booking systems who are on the call might do this in different ways but generally speaking that triggers some stuff like it emails out people with a confirmation number um, maybe it, it you know creates uh, something in their account whatever whatever some of that stuff is done like an email as a one one-off thing you don't really want to be sending a cancellation cancellation email immediately afterwards so um, the booking happens at the end and we want to confirm that is done in some booking systems you actually can't undo that within the API um, although that's something that obviously will be improved in the future um, so that's the idea of, of that kind of flow um, so if there's an issue with the lease and you can't reserve the slot of course nothing happens and um, you, you stop there um, so the two things we'd be interested to talk about today um, are around around that um, so does everyone understand what I've just kind of talked about in the context of that before we talk about the discussion points okay yep great um, I'm looking at some nodding if you're not if you're not visible then shout <laughs> um, so uh, the two kind of key questions here are there's an anonymous lease question which is just clarifying what we've currently got in the spec and making sure that's what everyone wants and if that fits the use cases um, from both the data consumer and brokers perspective and also the booking system perspective um, and the customers of the booking system and then there's this um, question about this the lease book two things that we get to at the moment the two different calls that is two calls there's a main a point people have made before is there a reason why we're doing this we have to store state in between the two calls to do that successfully to make the lease actually work um which adds an overhead to all the different booking systems so there's a question about that um but before we get into that we probably need to clarify the first point here which is anonymous leases um so just on the next slide then um one of the things that we had as an initial requirement in the requirements gathering workshop was to reserve a place for a user um, while they're doing their stuff while they're entering their details now that, that's kind of fallen out of the requirements uh, out of the um of the spec not um potentially uh entirely purposefully and that's one of the reasons we're surfacing it here because it, so everyone has, has has sight of that um and uh and so the question is about this requirement and then is it something that we can support both is it something that we want from the user's perspective is it something that we want to support from a booking system perspective um, and so for a third-party booking system where you don't know who the user is and here's two examples you've got a stripe standard flow where you can see you put the email address and card details in all at once and you press pay that's quite used quite a lot on smaller websites online um, and you've got Ticketmaster as an alternative. Um, so uh, on, on the first, the, the left-hand side, you've got kind of, you can just book it. That's what Amazon does, that's what other websites do. Um, Ticketmaster, you actually reserve the spot um, while you're typing the details. So you can see the top right there, there's a timer. Now that's actually five minutes started entirely anonymously. So I was just trying to book a ticket for Hamilton earlier today. And um, that, that timer started, I didn't put any details in. But that's to ensure that seat 31 and 32 are only for me and they can't be booked by anybody else while I'm going through the process of filling that in. Um, and so there's a question here because um, Amazon.com uh, does the first of those. So Amazon, you actually don't, if you can put something in your basket, it's only when you press checkout and pay that you actually have that item. So someone else can beat you to it. Um, and that's the case across most e-commerce sites because obviously they're optimizing for purchase. So they don't really care how many people are thinking about buying it. They're caring about the person that wants to buy it and they want to let that person through first because otherwise you might lose that person and the person who's taking their time to think about it might never book. Um, so obviously that's optimizing for just the revenue of the, um, um, the provider there. Um, however, there's a user experience angle to this, which is with a theater booking systems take um, as their approach, which is um, maybe I'm going to be disappointed as a person that's got seat 31, 32 reserved. And actually, I'd rather have less customers, but then not be disappointed by the process. Um, and so, you know, guarantee 31, 32, fill out the whole form and then go through that. Um, so the first discussion point um, is, this is a question really on both sides. Um, is this something that as a booking system is, that you support, that you're interested in supporting to allow people to start to, 
to create that kind of user experience and from a data consumer perspective um, is that something that you want to, to do is it something you're currently doing um, so from from our perspective the Amazon um, issue is I guess most of the time an edge case because you're uh, bidding for one item of which there are multiple duplicates right and so there are more often more items than there are people booking at any one time but when you're booking for, for example a theater the odds are that there's going to be 10 people at the same time aiming for that slot so it's um, a much worse user experience for the 10 for one slot and so it's an abundance question um, for me I think more often than not uh, there's probably going to be more slots available than there are people and you're going to be going for a generic uh, like a generic slot within a session rather than I'm having the third mat and so perhaps in that kind of uh, environment where there's no geolocation people aren't going to be bidding for preferred um, slots then it works but the second you introduce something like which court are you going to be booking then for me the second one makes sense so I would probably argue that you want to be able to book both ways if possible um, go straight for a booking without having to lease it or lease and book um, and then the that would we could be, work that out depending on what kind of um, resource it is that's basically being sold that's really really helpful Ken thank you has anyone on the booking system side got a response to that let me have a go as you might have guessed Nick I'm quite prepared to make a statement <laughs> uh, right or wrong okay so um, I think it depends a lot on the use cases as well so if we look at the way our our providers um, work there's a whole bunch of um, classes or courts that get fully booked within seconds as soon as they're available yeah so if what we're expecting is to model uh, or uh, support their current customer base then we do need that leasing because by the time it gets with the basket you know it will have gone and they'll be they'll be cross and they're very verbal when they cross the customers um if it's more about excess capacity so you're saying well you know we've got 20 percent of our 30%, 40%, and 50% of our classes are really popular, and the rest no one goes to, then we're back to the Amazon thing, where you're unlikely to get bothered in the meantime. So um, I think there's an extent to which is about what the providers want to let go of, uh, and I think most of our providers will not be very happy about their really, really popular classes getting out through a third-party site. So whether that's about timing of the availability, uh, that's a whole different story. I think the other thing from our perspective is that um, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to do an anonymous lease from a technical perspective. So when we lease, it's saying, uh, Mr. John Smith would like to book this class and we'll let you know if he gets around to paying for it. Um, we don't really have the concept of an anonymous lease from a technical perspective. And that idea of a, an account holder booking is kind of very heavily baked in. And I'm not quite sure we could take a, a, a nominal anonymous um, member, if you like, and then swap them out. I'd need to check on that with some more technical people than me. Um, I don't know if that's helped, but it's input. <laughs> that's really, really helpful. Very interesting. Um, the other concern that you might have with anonymous leasing is um, a single user could open up the the least the the booking page in 20 windows and least 20 of those booking slots anonymously and then all of a sudden nobody can book because there is no availability even though uh, only one of those windows is going to be used um, which is then becomes a challenge someone like Ticketmaster can deal with that problem because they own the user interface and so they can actually work out the single person leasing it but that would require the the booking systems API to trust the the their vendor, whichever website it is, to be preventing multiple leases by the same user. Um, and so that that would be a technical concern that I would have um, opening up our booking to somebody. Just, sorry, me again. Um, just going back to use cases, what. Uh, this is a question that's this piece of string one. Um, what's the balance do we think between um, 
people on the third party site who've never been there before and people who are repeat offenders. Because if most people are repeat offenders, there's probably some login process or there could be a login process. So you will have the ability to identify them uh, and, and do that fairly simplistically. If most of the sites are going to be having people go there once only, once only ever, A, I think you've got a bad business model. <laughs> But then you will have this problem with having to go through the whole registration workflow in some form to um, to get to the point where you know who they are. Do we have any feeling about that, uh, guys, uh, overall? So the, the flow we usually get on our site is we have return users that go straight to our service and we don't want to create a login barrier. So they will return to our site, they'll do their search, they'll select their class, they'll click to book, and at that point they log in, um, by which point they will have leased already. So the majority of the leases will be by anonymous users from our perspective until we get them to enter the details and log in. So the question there is around how to manage anonymous leasing for um, known users that aren't, aren't there. So Amazon, for example, does optimistic login. So it assumes that if you've been on that device before and you still have an old cookie, then you're kind of logged in, but you can't book anything. You can't, you can't pay for anything. Um, and then that's when they introduce the, no, you've got to actually log back in, but we'll assume you're the previous user. Um, and so that can be a model that you can take, but it does mean that even if you've got a login wall, unless you're a downloaded application, if you're a website, most marketplaces would, would or most booking systems that are um, open to the public would not want to force you to log in because that creates a significant barrier to uptake. Can I ask for um, a, a, just a prompt? Um, this is really, really great. I just wanted to make sure we got more people into the into the conversation. So um, I don't know if, if Jamie or uh, Ed or uh, Tom wanted to have a crack. I'll have a little uh, stab, to be honest. Um, what Kent's mentioned before um, makes sense. Um, so kind of agreeing around that's the kind of way we envisioned it would work. Um, so if I've got anything more to add, then agree, agree fully with what Kent's saying. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Jamie? Or maybe Jamie's just uh, not actually on the call, but pretending to be on the call. Um, Ed, did you want it from Booking Punk's perspective? Um, yeah, I mean that that rings true with uh, with the case of Booking Bug to, to quite a large extent. Yeah, we've got a notion of held items, um, so we're able to hold the appointment until uh, the customers completed some details, um, and then they complete the booking process. And then we actually have the payment as a separate process that happens after that, um, and we would. Uh, cancel the booking if it hasn't been paid for at that point um so yeah i can see how what we do maps to 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 what what you guys have been coming up with but um i mean in terms of them being anonymous it's it's something that we've you know it's it's very rare for us to not e even have an email address it it, it has come up but uh, and so we've had to support it in the past but it's it's relatively unheard of for us to to have to have to deal with in anonymous situations. So it sounds like what's emerging here, um, James just pinged me to say he's had tech issues, so he's going to come and rejoin again. Um, so um, what, what um, it sounds like there's a halfway here where people enter the registration details and then enter the um, payment details, and that the first part of that process is is if you saw the thing, you would expect by the time you got through registration. Uh, it might be gone, but then when you're in and you've registered, that when you press um, go on something and you want to book it, um, then then you've got a lease until the time you finish entering your credit card data. Um, so the and it, the things that would distinguish the two for me is if you store credit card details, obviously it's the same thing because you can be logged in and actually you don't need to have a lease. You can just pay with one click booking Amazon style. Um, and so I suppose I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what the value is of that. Of, it sounds like there's a, there's a kind of halfway here. And what the value of that is, is that something really useful to provide to people so that if they're in, they can enter their credit card details and they're, they're safe during that period. But the bit before that was where they were unsafe or 
is it that we want to say if you're logged in and you've given us your credit card details then you can book stuff quickly if you're the kind of person that wants to be booking a badminton court when there's only one left and um, you're booking at midnight because that's when those things happen generally during the day this stuff doesn't really affect it right but there, there are cru crucial times when as Ian was saying there is stuff that gets booked up and everyone goes crazy for it but if that's happening it's a bit more like ebay then would you expect them to have stored their credit card details as well and actually be ready to book and press the button um if that's the use case um my, my concern would be um without the lease because the lease holds the slot then the payment happens and then the booking occurs right if as um and it, 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 as a broker, we take the payment and then try and book the slot and it's not there, then we have to handle that process by then giving a refund to the user, um, which isn't necessarily always the smoothest way of doing it. So, so let's just say that's, that's actually the next topic. So that's a really good point. Let's just hold that for a sec. So okay. that's about, because you can, you can um, uh, lease a payment from a Stripe or... Yeah, that's how we do it in Stripe, but I, I know it's not true of all, all of them. Right, okay. Um, just, just briefly before we before we move on, um, I was just mulling over um, other reasons for having the, the, the lease. So um, one of the arguments for having lease is to give people time to you know, enter payment details. But one of the one of the requirements that we've got um, uh, on the backlog to think about is people providing a um, addition, answering a whole set of additional questions as part of making a booking. So information that needs to go to the, the organizer or et cetera, or just the things that have to be uh, collected. So that could add time to the booking process and might make an argument for giving people a bit of a window to, to enter things. It may be that those could be done after the, the actual booking is placed, but it, it, we'd have to think about how that well, I think what I'm saying is we have to think about some of this other stuff as well, and where this sits in the workflow, at what point that will be passed to the, the booking system. So, yeah, that, that's definitely that's definitely what we've got in our case. It's that yeah, we have these held held items for when we need to have uh, long forms of, of customer information that they need to be put in. It's just that we don't, but it's just that separate from the actual booking process before payment. So. Um, yeah, the held item is the temporary thing, but it's still not booked yet. But it is for that that very purpose of they might want to enter in a lot of information after they've selected their time, and they don't want to lose that time they've picked. Yeah, I mean the other thing I, I wondered is whether in in that process there is upsells or other things that they would add into their their booking, which would kind of increase that period where they're interacting, but. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So, with our users, they might own, they might, they might be making one booking through one provider and another booking through the other with a basket, as it were, and then perhaps checking out once with a single payment, um, because we might be aggregating certain things. Um, and so, it could be for um, our users a slightly strange experience to have part of it suddenly confirmed, but not the rest of their, the rest of their booking, as it were. Could I just um, check I've understood what Nick was summarizing? Um, what I thought Nick was saying, and I'm sure you'll correct me, is that you, you go through and you're anonymous and you click, I want to book of this, whatever this is. Um, at that point, it's not reserved, but then you will have to either log in or register. And at the end of the registration process, you're known. And at that point, you can put, you're effectively creating a lease. Yeah. So that's what I think Nick was saying by the halfway house. Um, to carry on with that from what Tali was saying, if you do do that, there's no reason why you can't add extra information afterwards, after you would register or logged in. Um, Nick, I want to ask you if that's what you're trying to say, if I got that correct. Yeah, that's right. Because I think that's quite a good compromise, you know, the, the excitement of booking something, and then a relatively short registration process, enter your email, put a password in, and then after that, you, you can lease it at that point. And I think that's, for me, a good compromise. So this might be a really good time actually to just um, to move on to the next bit of this um, and then uh, we can also bring in because I think that sounds that sounds brilliant um, I, I can see the, 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 the advantages of that kind of compromise obviously it comes at the cost of a slightly more complex process which is something that we want at the moment it's it's kind of 
a mandatory element in the spec, and this is one of Galena's comments originally around the complexity. Um, so just to quickly touch on um, some, some other bits of content and then to just then conclude the discussion um, with, with revisiting the whole, the whole thing together, I suppose, when we've got both bits of this covered. Um, so um, just on this bit then, there's, a two, there's two options. This is exactly what Kent was just kind of talking about. So um, there's a two-step booking approach, which you can take, which is where you lease, as we're saying, which you would need um, either anonymously to do or you would need some personal details as, as Ed and Ian were saying you can have um, to make a book at least at the halfway house um, that gives you the assurance you need to capture the payment and then when you've got the payment you can make the booking um, the alternative is um, and it's something that what I've seen and it's interesting uh, what Kent you were saying about some not all providers supporting this because we found um, the research we did most of them seem to be supporting it and actually saying it was it was best practice don't know um might be so we can pick up on that but um there is another approach which is supported by certainly some of the larger payment providers um which um is that you authorize the payment first um which effectively leases the payment side rather than leasing the booking you then make the booking in the booking system as just a single post that's done assuming that succeeds you then go ahead and what's called capture in payment terminology, the payment, which means you confirm the payment. And then at that point, it's taken from the card. For some reason, if you don't get to state step three, then either the authorization after a certain number of days or, or minutes, depending on what you set up, is automatically um, just disappears um, because that's how the payments process works. Um, and uh, so if you, don't, if you don't ever reverse it, or you can, you can tell the payment provider to just undo the authorization. And in those cases, the, the user won't get in their credit card statement, their bank balance, they won't see anything about the transaction that ever occurred there. If they've got Monzo, they'll get a little ping saying that they've been an authorization's been uh, attempted. Um, but that's that's only the newer banks that are doing that. And even then, I guess you'd be expecting that because you've you know you've gone through a process. So, um, and uh, and so that's that's the alternative. And so there's two kind of steps here. Um, and uh, and I guess one of the things I was interested in is is as a discussion point, because it's almost really the rest of its detail in terms of how that would work. I mean, it might just be to just kind of flesh this out if you go to the next slide, what that could look like, um, as opposed to what we currently have is, you, you basically, um, and this is the way that Google Reserve does it as well, which is um, another interesting uh, example. Um, you do what's, um, what I've called here a quote, basically. It's like a, you basically say, um, I've got these five items in my basket, can I book them? And the answer might be yes or it might be no because actually both of them are on the same physical court and you can't book them together or because one of them disappeared since you last checked. Um, so you have this call that you can make and every time you add something to your basket, the user experience, it, you, add, you make that call to just double check that that basket's still valid. If something disappears um, at some point when you're in the flow, then you could notify the user and say that thing that was in your basket's gone now, sorry, you were too slow. Um, and, and then... Uh, that does the check and then basically you do the other what we've just discussed there you authorize the payment amount um you then complete the order uh and then you capture the payment um and so that um and in terms of api calls and this is why i was interested to bring in um uh, tom and galena on this is obviously the minimum here is that you don't even need to check you don't even need the quote you could just authorize five pounds because that's how much the the system said it was worth if you if you were sure that you know, it was available because of the feed or because of uh, Opportunity API or something else that you have um, a knowledge of. If you have that knowledge, then actually you just need one call, which is just a book. So you can just, with one call, make the booking. And so, and for free calls, as well, for, for a free event as well, if you're sure that it's free, you're not taking any payment details, you can just make the same one call and it will confirm or not that that's been um, completed. Um, but you would obviously, if you were going to a registration process, you would make the first call there first to check, is it still available? Then you would take the details, then you make the free booking uh, in, in one go. Um, and so um, I guess that the, the, obviously there's a user experience difference here, but there's also the complexity of the booking system and the number of calls required is different um, because you only, the minimum need is just the one call that you can accept. And so for implementations like Good Gym, for example, where I know it's a lot simpler booking system and it's a free payment um, or other systems um, like our, our parks isn't on the call, but I know that they have a very simple system and they only take one type of payment for a certain type of class. 
Um, and, and so for those simpler systems, um, it would be less of a requirement. So, um, but I don't know, has anyone um, got any thoughts on that? I'm kind of particularly looking at Tom and Galena from a uh, perspective of your more simple, um, not simple, um, but wanting to, to, to have a quick response time within your apps. Are you referring to me as Tom? I was oh, talking I about Tom being, but I, I don't I know. That, I thought that. I was are just they, getting are they, uh, confused quickly. Uh, they're not muted. No. Galena, should have checked that you could actually. Can you hear me, Nick? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the headphones were on mute. Uh, I was thinking, which is why the hesitation were in there. Um, obviously, speed of booking is um, essential. Um, round trips are costly. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd jump one way or the other at the moment on this. So I'm, I'm kind of sitting on the fence and sort of trying to work through in my head. So, um, yeah, not adding much to that, but leave it with me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No worries. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, if Galena might have, uh, had some other technical issues. Let me try and unmute you there. Is that, is that you or is that Jamie I've unmuted? I'm not sure. No, Jamie's back on. Hi. Ah, it is you. Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, so there's not much to, to add here. I just wanted to say that uh, really we do have a lot of uh, customers with um, like many uh, classes um, that we have to call at once. And for example, uh, when some member is, is trying to book a class, it's, it's really crucial that uh, uh, that call is, is quick. So um, we don't have to like show endless spinners inside the app while uh, doing multiple calls to a system like uh, class booking system. So that is why as less calls as possible would be great. Just a second, what you've already said. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay. Obviously, there's... obviously, Nick, just on that, there's, there's obviously two points there. There's the number of calls and the speed of the calls. And it may actually be quicker to do more calls um, mm. overall time from a transaction than do fewer calls that take longer. But you, you only know when you've got the implementation, really. Interesting, yeah. Does anyone booking system side have a, any thoughts on that? I think that I'd kind of split down things that are free and things that aren't free. Um, certainly, I don't see a reason why the post order couldn't be in order quote. So if you know everything about the order and it's been authorized, then you can put that in. But um, there must be the ability to um, back out at that point. So one of the things I think that we need to identify with this process, and by the way, this is broadly the process that, that we follow anyway, is what's, how do we handle the error conditions? So if we don't get a response back from number three as an aggregator, um, what do we do? Um, do we assume it's not gone through? Do we have some way of asking if it's gone through? Um, obviously there will be some error states. If you're not leasing items in, in option one, then they may well have gone away, uh, in which case some may have gone away and some not. And so how are you going to present that to the customer when they've paid their $30 and it comes back and says, oh, we're giving you half of it back. Uh, in fact, it's maybe slightly worse than this because I think you may then have to ask them for payments again for $15 because I'm not sure you can only confirm part of the payment has been authorized. Uh, so you can you can confirm anything up to the authorized amount, um, but then that, that was a good question actually I had on my on my next slide if we got there, which was exactly that question. Does but does a user actually want to have half their stuff confirmed? Because if if actually the kids haven't got into their their crash or whatever it is, um, I maybe still don't, I don't want to go anymore because I can't go or, you know, it might be a reason why you try to book all those things together. And also, forgive me, but just going back to my earlier point, I think we'll struggle with it from to implement anonymous leases. So that's going to be that be quite challenging for us. I'm sure we can do it, but it's we talk quite challenging. What do you need to uh, make it a non anonymous lease? Just an identifier for the customer. So put, passing an email address would be fine. Because um, Nick, in your um, 
uh, screen earlier, and guys, sorry about the tech issues and for being late on the call. Um, but you used the Stripe example where it had the email address and card details. Um, when we send uh, payment and detail uh, via an API using Stripe, we actually collect the um, user details off Stripe and then Stripe is just used to process the payment. So you'll still have the, the name and any other information you'll want from the user, like phone number and email address, um, and you'll send and resend that to the booking system. Um, and then we send the, we, 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 we get the payment from Stripe and send the token from there. But it's using a combination of our own system and, and what we collect from Stripe. So, so that doesn't. Uh, so that, that you're basically saying when you when you capture the, it's actually slightly different to this because you're saying you capture the the card details first from Stripe. That comes with the kind of email address, and then you use that to make. If you want, to, you could use that to make a lease. But we're still. If you go back a, sl a step, Lee, to the previous slide, that that's I guess still um, both of these would be possible with that approach because. Yeah. You're, you either at the point where you talk to Stripe, you could then use that same content you've captured to auth the payment and then go through and do two and three on the right-hand side. Yeah. Um, or you could, as you say, you're taking that same detail from Stripe and instead of that, you're putting it into leasing an order into one and then going through and capturing the payment and booking. On yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. And, and just with uh, the auth payment, um, what was the compatibility um, going to be like? uh for all the systems i know you, you referenced a few that might be um uh taking a more direct route uh and i just worry about the overall compatibility with the auth payment yeah we need to we definitely need to check that i don't know if kent you've got any examples that you can think of which you're aware of don't support that so we couldn't find any but doesn't obviously mean that they're not there um to be fair, that was off memory from about two years ago. So I may be a little bit out of date on that one. But I do think some of the more obscure ones might not. Um, but then maybe that's not really the concern here. Um, I think the point for me is the shift to the new four-point structure you were talking about, two steps. Um, that makes a lot of sense. It does move it to stateless, which I think actually probably presents a more stable way of dealing with it because, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the person who raised it. The the issue of errors is always going to turn up, right? That's almost a guaranteed thing with web transactions. So if you're dealing with errors, then you kind of want to, you, you kind of want a system that's resilient to it. And that's very much the same problem as when you're trying to um, process part of a transaction uh, or no, as a single transaction and then the resource becoming unavailable. So maybe stateless as a model is actually more resilient might not be the best user experience, but it's certainly more technically resilient, so. But, but it, um, uh, forgive me if I've misunderstood something, Ian's point about if there's a failure at three, and you don't know whether it's successful or not. If you've got no state at all, you're in an undefined state. How do you, how do you, how do you unwind from that? When you say a failure at three, sorry, with, with, without a failure, with, with a kind of 500, <laughs> No, so the order's posted, but you don't get a, um, uh, maybe you get a timeout in the response. So you're unclear about whether it's been accepted by the booking system or not. So um, what do you do? Do you submit another order? Oh, it's a good, it's a good question. So I, I the potency, um, you, could, you could submit the order if you're going fully stateless, as Kent was saying, you'd submit it with a GUID and then you would just retry against that GUID until you got something sensible um, from that that would clarify what's happened either way. Okay. But I, I see that, that I guess, that, yeah, there's uh, probably there's a stateless paradigm thing around this approach, which is like you say, I guess that's probably why that's happened. But um, it sounds like, because, so, so here's, here's a, a, a suggestion. I don't know what, what people think, because if let's say that we had a setup like this where it was stateless, however, you could optionally create a lease um, at an earlier point in the process if you wanted to do so with however much detail you wanted to provide and maybe the different systems would, would require a different amount of detail. So the lease might in some systems require um, a person object to be passed with an email address and a phone number. So legend would sound like it would be in that from the beginning. Um, and then other systems might allow you to just make an anonymous lease um, with no detail at all. 
and um, then you can pass that ID optionally into the post uh, on on three to con then confirm that. Um, but I, I guess my question is really if, so at the moment the situation we're in is we've got, it's a mandatory leasing situation. So everyone's got to implement leases um, in systems, um, both sides. Um, so I suppose the question is if, if we all, if that's a common case and everyone thinks that we want them, then obviously that, that is that complexity that's useful. If it's the case of actually there's some systems will want it, some systems won't. And actually, as Galina was saying, some people just want to make a call to the API and crack on. Um, and maybe we, we would have a simpler approach where the lease is there, but optional. Um, I, I don't know, it's just a proposal. What do you think? I think uh, from our point of view, uh, we, we have been operating on a basis of um, just making the booking immediately uh, without the need of a, of a, of a lease, I, I believe. Uh, and it's not ideal, but it does work now. Kind of our, our error rates are around two percent um, for facilities, so it's um, something that we would like to cut out. But if there is um, a kind of staggered approach, then that might be more sensible at this point. So, Jamie, just a, a point there: two percent may sound good. But I think if you're dealing no. with tens of thousands of bookings, then 2% yeah. starts to look fairly horrific. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, I agree. It's not ideal it's, it's, for, for us. I mean, because we've been, um, uh, yeah, just kind of getting on with it. We would definitely prefer a, a, a way of, of, of cutting that right back. But in the context of this conversation, if it's uh, much more challenging than... Um, it's something that we've survived with so far. Well, that's, I mean, I don't necessarily think we need to, um, it, we should probably engineer this to actually be as robust as is, is useful for the users. So, you know, as, as Ian says, 2% is massive if you've got a huge number of transactions. Yeah. Uh, what, what exactly does 2% represent? Of it, um, what, what part of the process do they fail at and how does it fail? I think that's a kind of combination of um, uh, whether the booking goes or whether there is an error on the payment side. Uh, I'd need to like look into that a bit further, but um, that's just an uh, error rate overall of, of the booking. Right, okay. So I suppose that the main, the main error rate we're interested in that this would solve is number of people that started to yeah. book and then, and then it didn't, and then they got there and it was, it was sold out. So we've got a like, only a few minutes left on the call, um, and while I don't, this is a really good discussion. I don't really want to stop it, but um, you know, we've got limited time. So I'm starting to wonder: is there anybody else who wants to set, chip in that hasn't had a chance to say anything yet? Uh, Raymond, I see you joined quite late in the call, but I wonder whether you had anything. You yeah, no, the only thing I was going to add um, is that uh, we learned quite painfully over the years that um, the most reliable way for this to work is to have a leasing system up front where when um, when you when you start the booking process as as soon as you've got enough information you have to reserve that slot <clears throat> um, we have a lot of use cases where people will tend to release um, classes and things like that with a with a fairly short book ahead period um, and as a result there's a mad rush of people trying to book um, all of the spaces that you've got available you know, in those classes. And um, if there's no leasing system in place, then you land up getting a lot of conflicts and it turns into a massive customer service nightmare um, where, where you've got people that have paid for bookings that they now can't take or all sorts of problems like that. So we've, we've learned over the years that the, that the best way to do it is, is, is for you to treat it like it is a theatre ticket sale where you have to reserve the seats and they're reserved for a certain amount of time, possibly for as long as you have the basket active. Um, and then uh, only once it's all actually paid for, do you then go and finish, uh, finish making the bookings. Um, especially when you've got baskets that allow you to add multiple items into them. So you could have multiple bookings forming, forming part of a single order. Um, there's just no way that it would work uh, without you having to lease those spaces because some people will take half hour, 45 minutes for them to finish the whole purchase. And 
you know, in that half hour, 45 minutes, everything that they've, that, they've, that they've put into the basket and they believe that they've got can then just get stolen out from under them and they just massively irate when that happens. That's fantastic feedback. And especially on the timescales there, because I, I, I mean, even in terms of what we recommend as a lease duration um, in the spec, 45 minutes is quite a long time to have the item held for by a, by a user. And obviously that's, it's interesting because on Amazon's case, they would rather obviously get that sold to the next available person. But like you say, if that creates irate customers, then it's probably not, it's not the trade-off we, we really want here. So really interesting. Mm. Just to echo what Raymond said, actually, we've moved to a, a two-phase commit, two-step payment, um, because we had uh, the odd problem, and you're always going to have the odd problem, and unpicking it when you've got the kind of uh, two-step booking, whatever it was, where you know you've taken the money, do you take the money and book, or do you book and take the money? And either way, you can end up with real challenges in tracking down where it went wrong, and actually knowing if it did go wrong. Uh, obviously, in theory, all your errors are captured and you've got someone assiduously looking through the logs. But let's face it, that doesn't happen. So the first thing you discover is a problem that you've got cross customers, then you've got to chuck it down. So I think a two phase approach, a two step payment is essential. Um, and I think the basic sequence there is kind of right. Um, if we are going to have the option of uh, not having a one with multiple items in the basket, then I think the, the basket was either fully succeed or fully fail. Um, so, you know, if you don't manage to book one for some, one of the, the items for some reason, you have to roll the whole thing back. Yes, that makes complete sense. Um, you, yeah, you don't want to, you, you want to then let the user confirm. Okay. Um, so that's great. And I'm probably going to have to listen through this call a couple of times just to kind of get down the, the wisdom that's been shared. Um, what so much I, good wisdom, so much density. It's great. Okay. <laughs> what I'm what I'm wondering is how how we um, how we capture this in a way that everyone feels comfortable that we've dealt with the, the, the variety of use cases. Because I think what I've heard is that there's some variety based on the the way people uh, design their UX. There's some stuff around um, how you know back office stuff is handled, um, and that there's some uh, probably some necessary requirements and some useful variation in a few places. Um, so if we, for example, just put together a shared document that just spell out and all of these different variations, um, so that we could try and I you know more clearly identify that one solution or another is going to tick off more of those than others or at least demonstrates that we found a compromise would would that be a useful way forward but at the moment that we just kind of captured a requirement for a lease without really kind of putting any context around it so um maybe we do need a bit more information what, what do people think i mean potentially we could we could go through this call as you say and document all of that into into some bullet points share that round and then maybe in another call when we've got that presented we can present that back as a uh, you know, it's a pros and cons table or if it's a it sounds like ultimately what we're talking about here is do we make the lease mandatory or optional because it sounds like there's definitely a lease required uh, in in some use cases that um, people really want that it sounds like um, if we, based on that decision there's a bunch of things that, like William was saying about complete failure or complete success that we need to make sure that we are design one of those two um, correctly um, take into account everything which could then be in the next call discussion how do we make that thing work um, it sounds like the first question is really do we um, do we think that that people's disappointment of the theater ticket question basically is, is, is you know how to what extent is their disappointment over um, that that kind of getting to the end of the, the process and not succeeding um, and and if we think that that's worth making a mandatory thing that we then have every booking system implement and obviously the, there's a cost to that but it might be worth it if the user experience is worth it um, then maybe that's where we need to kind of be really clear so like, these are the pros and cons and that way every time we work with a new booking system and they say why on earth are we doing these two calls we can say well it's a really well documented thing here that says these are all the reasons and actually your users are going to be much more happy and your customers will be much more happy and everything else um, and and so I think it's 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 I, th I would suggest that it's fine to do more work if it's well justified. Um, and the thing with the standards thing is, obviously, every every extra bit will need to um, everyone in the ecosystem will need to implement everything that's mandatory. So the 
and there's a bigger cost, but it'd be worth it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, within within the design space, there's um, we can find ways so that leasing is like the leasing calls would be cheap. So to address the point earlier about you know a couple of quick calls might be just as good as one you know a single call. Um, we can dig into uh, if there is state for a lease, then what does that mean? You know, if, if Ian needs to implement anonymous leases, then are, what are the options for doing that that might fit within current workflows? So I think um, so. I think the the, the, main, the main action we'll take away is to start to try and um, pull that uh, that document together and then share that around with everyone so that we can do that follow up as Nick suggested. Yeah, the other thing which I'd just like to add, just um, you know, just a last point on that. Just because you've got a lease system in place doesn't mean that there is um, no way for you to have a single endpoint for you to fire and forget one, you know, one, you know, one single booking at a time. You know, so if you've got all of the, you know, all of the places in place for you to have a lease and then do the multi-stage order, it's it's then a a a relatively simple operation for you to provide one endpoint where you can provide all the information required for you to do the lease and make you know, and make all the rest of the order in a single call and and the actual booking system will then itself just say make a lease quickly go and do all this other stuff and then make the order at the end of it and it's just one call you know all wrapped up for that case where you know it's just a booking that you just want to go and make the booking yeah okay um, thanks everybody. Another uh, really useful call. Um, so we've got some clear actions to take forward and um, we'll be in touch with that shared document shortly. Okay. Um, any, again, if there's any other things that come up, post them to the main list, stick an issue on the booking API, GitHub account, so we can keep the conversation going. Or drop me an email. <laughs> yeah. uh, That's um, great. Cool. Uh, right. Uh, thanks, everybody, and I will speak to you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.